doing pizzas and trying to do it quietly, uh, but we'll start the panel. Um, we have four panelists with us today. We have Professor Del Banchio. He teaches in the Department of Strategic Communication in the Temple Undergraduate School. Uh, Professor Rogers teaches here, uh, mostly labor employment law and torts. Um, and then, <laughs> sorry, towards everyone else, and uh, Rosie and Sheila Medali are members of the Legal Collective at Occupy Philadelphia. Um, and I'm just going to turn it right over to them so that we can get some answers. Um, hi, folks. As Diane said, my name is Professor Jason Del Gandio. I am an assistant professor at the Department of Strategic Communication. I teach in the area of rhetoric and public advocacy. One of my areas is social movements, so I study a about social movements. But I'm also, I've also participated in social movements for the last 11 years of my life. I got started in the anti globalization movement in about 2000. I was participated in the anti-war movements of the early 2000s. I worked on issues with free trade, anti-war, peace activism, etc. So as I speak today, I speak both as a scholar of social movements as well as a participant in the Occupy movement. So I'm part of the Occupy movement. At the same time, I want to make sure that everyone realize that I'm not here as a representative of the movements. I'm right? speaking from own personal experience, my own personal observations, etc. And I guarantee that if we have five more people moving here, they might have five different opinions about how the movement functions. Okay? Um, first, I'd like to give a brief overview of how the movement actually started, generally speaking. Um, in mid-July, the anti-consumer magazine Adbusters had a general call to Occupy Wall Street. So if you're not familiar with Adbusters, there's a magazine, a website, kind of a whole network of anti-consumers. In mid-July, they put out a call asking people to go to Wall Street, literally, to occupy that space. After that call was put out, certain activists and organizers got together and started to organize the basic logistics of making this happen. Then, beginning September uh, 17th, people actually went to uh, Ducati Park, which is now the Liberty Park, the Liberty Park, the Liberty Plaza, and they began to physically occupy that space. The first couple of days, the first week or so, it was not that well attended, maybe a few hundred to a few thousand people a day, day at the time. Then there was the um, protest in March that were over Brooklyn Bridge that many of you probably heard of when you saw the news. And that's what made national news. And so people started to march on the Brooklyn Bridge and hundreds of people got arrested going that day. Right? Based on that experience, it went national and became much more popular after that time period. Okay. Then all of a sudden, rather than a few hundred, you have thousands of people attending to Cotty Park and occupying that space. Now, in Philadelphia, um, in Philadelphia, um, some activists and organizers that I know and friends with, they decided to see if they could organize an occupation movement here in the city of Philadelphia. Right? Uh, many of those people um, staff act and volunteer at the Wooden Shoe Bookstore down on South Street. I think it's South Street and 7th Street, I'm not entirely sure, but down there. Within a couple of days, I think it was 48 hours, they had something like 450 responses on Facebook. And they realized that their bookstore could no longer hold this capacity of people. They searched around and actually got a church on Broadway right by City Hall. Right? And there, there was two basic general assemblies that were held. Right? The first general assembly had approximately 400 people, and the second general assembly had almost 1,000 people, if not over 1,000 people. Right? During those general assemblies, we used direct democracy and consensus decision-making processes to figure out what we're going to occupy and when we're going to occupy. Right? Then we came to a collective decision to occupy beginning October 6th, 9 a.m. in the morning. And from that point onward, there were people down at City Hall occupying that space. Um, as of a week ago, I believe the number was there were 330 tents that were permanently there at City Hall. Right? That's not to say that every tent there is occupied or has a person living in it. For instance, some people do live there full time, but they have occupied that space indefinitely. Other people have tents there, they leave them there, will go back and forth depending upon their schedule throughout the day. Does that make sense? Right? I did a quick rundown and I could spend hours on this topic for an hour. But in general, that's the beginning of how the Occupy Wall Street began and how Occupy Philly began. Now, um, some people, or in at least in the mainstream mass media, some people say, well, there's no clear message, and I actually disagree with that wholeheartedly. I think there's a very clear message about what was going on. And the way that I phrase and frame this message is that the movement is the message. Right? So again, the movement is the message. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, look at what people are actually doing in the Occupy movement. Right? At least with Wall Street, they are occupying Wall Street. Now, what is Wall Street? Wall Street is the epicenter of the corporate world, literally, right? both literally and symbolically. Right? So when you think of Wall Street, you think of the corporate world. Right? Almost all of them, many of the major financial institutions in the world are at, at, at Wall Street. 
So the idea is we're going to occupy this space. Now, what does it mean to occupy? In other words, we're going to reclaim this space for democratic purposes. In other words, we're going to occupy Wall Street and infuse it with democratic practices, philosophies, ideas, ways of life, etc. Right? So the idea is to occupy Wall Street and to reclaim that space for democratic purposes. Now, when we say democracy, obviously we do live in a democratic society to one degree or another. It's obviously a critique discussion. Right? But for the most part, yes, we, are, we do live in a democratic society. But within this movement, the movement is organized around direct democracy. Right? So it's a full democracy where all individuals are asked to and invited to participate in decision-making processes. Right? So for instance, down at City Hall, there's a general assembly every night at 7 p.m. Right? That general assembly is based on a consensus decision-making process. Right? Where people, collectors of people come together and they collect the decisions amongst themselves about what to do, what letters to write, who to speak to, what working committees to organize, etc. Along the same lines, I would argue, um, and factually, I would argue that the movement is actually very well organized. From the outside looking in, some people say, well, it's a bunch of hippie dippy kids, nothing's really going on, there's no social structure going on here. There are multiple working groups that are set up there. I think Philadelphia has at least 10, maybe 13 or 14 working groups. Everything from a food station, to media, to messaging, to childcare, to book sharing, to a library, etc. Right? In many ways, City Hall and this occupation movement have become its own little city, its own little culture, the striving to get outward and to spread its message. Now, in terms of this message, some people say, well, what do you actually want? Right? Again, the way that I personally frame this is that the Occupy movement is trying to create a system that privileges people before profits. Right? So again, to create a, a system that privileges people before profits. So one of the major critiques is that the American system, not just the economy, but the American system that we live in, produces profit over people. Right? Now, we're, how do I back that up? We'll look at some basic facts. Uh, we've had billion dollar bailouts for the richest institutions on the face of the planet. With that very same money, we have billion dollar bonuses for CEOs. Right? And then in my personal critique, and I think many people would agree with me, we have a political system that is bought and sold by Wall Street. Right? So Barack Obama, for instance, who is a supposed liberal, liberal Democrat, has already received over $50 million from financial institutions on Wall Street in campaign money. We're still a year out from the election. Right? So the idea is, at the very least, what the opponent wants is to remove Wall Street money from politics. Right? At the very most, it is to transform the American political system. Right? Use your imagine, imagination as widely as you want. Right? Now, again, why would we do that? When we have approximately 46 million people living in poverty in this country, we have 50 million people without health insurance, we have 3.5 million people who are homeless, right, and so on and so on. There's a ton of stats from people who are right? So the movement is basically saying, look, there's a basic structural inequality within this country, and part of that is based on the idea that we live in a society that we profit, that profits, excuse me, that privileges profit for people. The movement is trying to overturn that system and bring in a system that privileges people for profits. If you have any questions afterwards, then I will address some questions there. Thank you for your time. All right, thanks so much. Uh, I'm going to sit because my eyes aren't good enough uh, to see my notes at this point. Um, so I want to talk about uh, class mobility and equality in the US. And I think Occupy is largely, or possibly not wholly, about the perceived collapse of the American dream over the past generation. So what exactly is the American dream? People toss the term around a lot. Oftentimes we think of it as prosperity, Ozzy and Harriet living out in the suburbs and having a couple of dogs. I think it's actually a lot more modest than that. I think it's security. I think it's what working class families obtained for a very short period during the 20th century, 1938 to 1970, very roughly speaking. A time when wages were roughly pegged to inflation, jobs were secure, retirement was covered, health care was covered. One could, working 40 or 50 hours a week, buy a small house, a modest house, and working another job uh, and some overtime, afford a, you know, a decent vacation. Your kids could go to college and possibly move up, or at least they could have the same standard of living that you could have. There are all sorts of limitations to that model. Uh, it applied mainly to white workers, mainly to men, mainly to industrial workers. But the key is that at least for a significant segment of the working class in this country, and this is true globally as well, <coughs> life wasn't precarious for a short period. People didn't have the threat of crushing poverty hanging over their heads as they had during repeated recessions and depressions during the 19th and early 20th centuries uh, in the US or as they or their parents had had in their countries of origin. 
So something like the need to get beyond pure precarious existence, I think, motivated the labor movement in the 1930s. Much of it carried over into the parts of the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s, particularly SNCC in its early days uh, in the South, and Martin Luther King's Poor People's Movement towards the end of his life. In both of those situations, the idea was that the state needed to not just protect people, but protect people against private exercises of economic power. Uh, we need, the state needed to step in and restrain corporations and other private institutions so that they would not, uh, not push around everybody else in society. And Occupy, I think, is tapping into that same demand. Uh, the idea that American and global prosperity needs to be shared more equitably and that individuals need to have a sort of true freedom that only comes with financial stability and independence. So it's not prosperity, it's basic security. And I think it taps into a, a basic anti-consumerist trend that's been growing in the US as well. Part of the idea of class mobility in the United States has long been that we don't have to live our parents' lives. We can try to make more money, or we can actually be happy with less money, right? We can, we can try to get a house in the city, we can try to live in the suburbs, we can try to live out in the country. We can make choices about what kind of life we want to have. Occupy, I think, is tapping into this, and many people who are involved uh, are pushing, and not all, many, simply many want a better chance to have a life, to have a decent life and not be living a purely precarious existence. Others are pushing against the relentless pressure in the US to work harder and make more money simply to keep up with the Joneses. That's certainly true, I think, of the middle class and upper middle class participants, at least to some extent. They want a more humane uh, pace of life and a more humane type of life than is available to them right now. Again, this demand is coming from a different angle, but I think it's starkly reminiscent of one of the demands of the labor movement in the last 19th century, summarized in the phrase, the labor of a human being is not a commodity. But we want to have a richer life, richer work lives, and richer lives outside of work. So why does Occupy emerge now? I think there are three reasons, two closely interrelated and then a third. The first is the decline of Keynesianism and the growth of financialization uh, as a means of boosting aggregate demand and preventing repeated crises of profit. Uh, if you look at the last, uh, the, last, uh, the last economic cycle, financial institutions, the so-called fire sector, finance, uh, insurance, and real estate, led growth in the last boom. And we hear a lot about wealth being shunted up to top income brackets, but think about the mechanisms through which that actually occurs. Extremely high salaries, people making more than five or $10 million a year are people in the financial sector, from investment bankers to traders to hedge fund managers. There are very few people outside that sector who make that kind of money. The one group that does are corporate executives, and how do they make that money? Through stock options. Uh, so again, tapping into the financial sector and financialization of the economy. You then have very high salaries among people who are giving services to the financial sector, lawyers, accountants, and consultants. And then a fairly remarkable drop-off to what you could call the upper, upper middle class of junior elite attorneys, managers, and others making you know, somewhere around $250,000 a year, who are poor in comparison to the people who they're working for. They're plumbers for, uh, for people in the financial sector. You know, one way of thinking about this is that the financial sector has become a mechanism for capturing all possible wealth uh, from the other 97% of the population. And this happens in a number of ways. It happens through mortgage refinancing, uh, which ends up taking value out of homes and shunting portions of it up to the financial sector. It happens by decreasing uh, real wages as a result of union busting and, um, and monetary policies that try to keep inflation down at all costs. Through broad informalization and precarization of the labor market, uh, privatization and individualization of retirement savings through 401k funds, and the elimination of any meager, the, the meager social welfare state and state-funded education that the US ever had to begin with. What's most frightening, I think, in this environment is that the money class no longer even needs the domestic economy to perform all that well in order to continue taking home the salaries that they're going to due to the globalization of product markets and the vast untapped consumer bases in other countries around the world. So, number one, decline of final Keynesianism and growth of financialization. Number two, I think closely related to this, though operating on a different plane, is the increased penalization of, of everyday life. Uh, from the receipt of welfare benefits, to receipt of public schooling, to behavior on public transportation, to warrantless wiretapping, to the growth and militarization of police forces around the country, to the ever-expanding surveillance state. Something like 60% of taxes, I think it might be even more, in Philadelphia are going to law enforcement and jails, which is money that working people could be putting to much better uses. And particularly when having any kind of criminal record starkly limits your job prospects, we have to start questioning whether this penalization of everyday life is serving uh, functionally, if not actually intentionally, as a means of limiting access to the middle class and disciplining the working class. 
Note also the soft penality of certain forms of private discipline, particularly here, the necessity of debt as a means to finance a middle class life, both through access to a middle class, uh, access to the middle class in the first place, uh, having to take out student loans in order to finance an education, which is the way to access the middle class in the US, uh, and uh, taking on consumer debt and house debt in order to simply have the standard of life that goes along with being middle class in the US, particularly as we you know, to continue to create or have for a long time uh, propped up the housing market through a series of asset bubbles that drive prices up so high that people have to continue borrowing. So, the results of all this I think are fairly straightforward, and you can see them reflected in the demands that Occupy is making. The working class and middle class aren't just being squeezed, it's actually becoming very hard to access the middle class, and very hard to stay in the middle class, and very hard to even stay in the working class. Taking on substantial consumer and educational debt is no longer a luxury or a choice, but actually a structural imperative. If you want to get, a, uh, get an education, live near your job, and enjoy any of the basic trappings of middle class life in the US. The education system for a decade or more has been moving towards a self-pay model that relies on a strong job market for students to pay off their loans, but as a result of the, of the collapse of the succession of asset bubbles that, were, that effectively maintained aggregate demand, the job market is simply awful and unlikely to recover anytime soon. Couple this with the physical precariousness that goes along with the penalization of everyday life and the militarization of police forces, and there's substantial discontent growing in the country. So, I think Occupy is putting out a demand for basic fairness uh, and for restraint of private power that resonates quite deeply in US political culture and US political life. And in this regard, it's not unlike many other social movements we've had in the past. Now there's one change that I am actually kind of hopeful about, and this is uh, part of, I think, the secret to Occupy success, which is a revolution in how we can participate in politics and civil society. So alongside the collapse of Keynesianism has been a collapse of many of the institutions that once structured working class and middle class life and gave people access to political power. Unions, churches, secondary associations, even long-term employment. Um, but alongside that has been a tremendous growth in social media and social media's use as a means of political mobilization. Uh, starting about 10 years ago uh, with groups like Move On, moving on to groups like the Progressive Change Campaign Committee and others who are really engaging in grassroots politics through social media. Uh, then to the Arab Spring, organized in part through Facebook and Twitter, and now to Occupy, which amazed, uh, I mean, there's a great generational shift here. Occupy is actually you know, sees move on at this point as too much part of the establishment. So we have stage one and stage two uh, of social media revolutions and, and political participation in the US. So, okay, it, this allows people to access political power directly by creating their own associations, their own communities of interest, rather than having to go through the institutions that dominate us uh, in, the, in the Keynesian era. So where are we going with this? Uh, I think it's it's very hard to predict, obviously. Uh, but I'm, I, you know, a couple of strategic thoughts and a couple, you know, one cost for hope. Uh, one is the globalization of Occupy. Uh, as I said at the beginning, the top one percent, the top three percent, no longer requires a strong domestic economy uh, or even anywhere close to full employment in order to continue making the kind of money they're making. Any movement that's going to challenge them has to be global in scope, and that's happening with Occupy now. And I find that very, uh, very heartening. Uh, the second is um, the question of uh, uh, messaging. What sort of uh, of messaging, sort of internal leadership of Occupy as a movement, and the question of a formal versus an informal structure. One of the common criticisms that you see launched against Occupy is that they, you know, there are no demands, you know, no one knows what people stand for, no one knows where this is going, etc. Uh, there's a long tradition of social movements in the US and thinking about social movements that says that social movements achieve most of what they're going to achieve before they become formalized. This, I think, in my mind, certainly true of the labor movement in the 1930s, likely tr very true of many elements of the civil rights movement and then the student, uh, student movements and anti-war movements, which often themselves rejected formalized leadership structures. Uh, at the time when we put in place and embraced formalized leadership structures, that is a, 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 an invitation for uh, others to begin negotiating and to try to co-opt certain elements of the movement. So uh, to keep, the, keep things as democratic uh, and as participatory as possible, I think, is not a mistake, but in fact, actually a strategic advantage. Finally, momentum. 
Uh, so the other thing that happens in social movements again and again is that growth leads to growth. Participation by some people leads to participation by more. There's a self-reinforcing dynamic, and this is something that Occupy, I think, is doing brilliantly right now. Uh, protests are ongoing. Uh, they are growing. They are expanding. The more people who get involved, they're going to get more people involved. Uh, so to continue building that however possible, it may require some degree more, I mean, there's going to be a tension between that type of building and, you know, needing some kind of formalization, but Occupy right now, as I understand, is, you know, working to balance those, we'll hear about in just a moment. Um, on, a, on, a, on a just final note, though, the thing that I'm most heartened about here is that for the past, you know, five years, ten years, we've been hearing about how the country is moving inexorably to the right. And we saw the Tea Party grow as uh, a, an expression of discontent with government and with private power as well. Uh, but it came from a, a right-wing position. And uh, what Occupy, I think, is demonstrating is that the Tea Party is not the only game in town. In fact, far from it. Many people's uh, frustration with the state, many people's frustration with private power is not conservative or reactionary. It's actually progressive. Uh, it's actually a left-wing concern. People want more equality, not less. Uh, people want uh, people want the types of things we were able to achieve during that short period uh, in the mid 20th century, and that I think is what Occupy is really tapping into. So thanks a lot. I'm 
I can see the, the legal strategy that's being used, and I understand it and it makes sense in terms of winning and losing in court, but I think there's a lot of considerations that activists have that are not just about winning and losing, it's about furthering a political message, it's about solidarity, it's about movement building, and sometimes that matters more than getting the footing. But, uh, yeah, I don't know, I'm also still figuring all of this out, so if anyone has suggestions of how I can balance these dual roles, I would love to. So I'm not trying to steal people away from legal observing, um, but I do want to say that the work that I've been getting to do is work that people have planned to do while, when I was in law school. It's, it's really amazing work, and I'll hold on for the question. Cool. We're going to take questions. Raise your hand. I'll point at you. You. Hi. Um, thanks, Catherine. Um, you you talk about um, uh, state repression, state, you know, privileges, private individuals, corporate bailouts, welfare, things like that, uh, corporate welfare. We also talked about restraining private individuals and private power. So my question is, um, how do you reconcile those two? How do you restrain state power without private uh, empowering private individuals? And how do you restrain private power without empowering the state? Because, you know, the same state that's doling out benefits is also the same state that's in you know, mass incarcerating millions of people and, you know, killing people all around the world. So, you know, I just want to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, so when I talk about restraining private power, I mean restraining corporate power largely. Um, you know, obviously the state is restraining private individuals in all sorts of ways as well. Uh, I think that, so this, it's, it's fundamentally just a question of politics. Uh, what's it going to take? to make sure that all of the new technologies of surveillance and, uh, and, um, and uh, discipline uh, private individuals that are now being used by the state and actually to turn turns uh, and used to make sure that companies are actually upholding their social obligations. Uh, I don't think that's at all impossible, right? Um, I don't, but I, you know, I, it's just extraordinary to me that 
millions of people go to jail in this country for possessing marijuana, and no one's gone to jail because of what happened in Wall Street to those two. It's astonishing, right? But this is essentially, it's a political struggle. So it's going to require people to actually demand uh, changes to the types of criminal laws that we have, uh, and changes to the types of economic regulations that we have. Oh, so. Bob, uh, my question's for the communication professor. Earlier when you spoke, you related Marshall McLuhan's media as the me medium is the message. I said the, to, movement, the movement was the message. Right, right. To, the, the movement right. is the message. Um, but if the movement is the message, if a physical presence is the message, how does that relate to an end goal? You see, because you were talking about the end goal, people, says, people say it may be vague, uh, not well defined, and you stated, well, the fact <coughs> that there is a movement is the message, so therefore, how does that relate to an end goal? No, it's a very good question. I guess to clarify, one of the things I, I'd, I'd ask us to do is to look at what people are actually doing in the Occupy movement, right? So at the most basic level, they are occupying public space together, right? So it's a collective, right? So there is this deep desire for these individuals, including myself, right, to come together in kind of a face-to-face -face communication and a way to talk about ideas, struggle together, laugh, think about things, how can we work these processes out, right? That's at one level. But then also, though, if you think about if you think about what people are actually doing, let's say for instance at City Hall here, right, we are participating in creating a certain kind of micro world that kind of champions alternative values, right? So we are taking issues of human want and human need and putting those first, right? So we need daycare center, right? So people are bringing their kids there and the and the mother father wants to go in March, who's gonna take care of the kids, right? We have um, a a food table, a food uh, tent, right? So we are feeding people every day. There's approximately, I heard, I think a couple weeks ago, that we were feeding 3,000 people a day, many of which were homeless, right? So it's the idea of putting human beings first, putting human want first, as opposed to, for instance, corporate profit, corporate greed. So when I say the movement is the message, look at what people are actually doing in the movements, and that's the kind of world that we actually want to create in the future. What we're actually trying to create it right now, right, right in the present moment. Right? It's called uh, prefigur prefigurative politics. In other words, you can prefigure the future world in the very moment right now. Does that make sense? I still don't understand how that relates to an end goal of what people want out of the movement, if the movement is the message. Okay. What we want, like I said before, is to create a society that, uh, that privileges people before profits. And that's what the movement is actually doing. Right? So it's actually doing what it wants in the future. How many people do you think, would, if I walked into City Hall right now and talked to some Occupy people, would come up with that? Because that sounds more like a co-op than an end goal for our new government structure. Like I said, the beginning of my talk, I'm not here as representative, I'm here to speak on behalf of myself. Right. right. But again, though, I mean, I also, I don't think you're going to find people, unfortunately, that are as articulate about, about as, as I am on a PhD, a professorship in communication, right? That's about maybe 0.001% of the human population. Um, but again, though, I do think if you look at what people are actually doing, it's not so much what are the, uh, what's the ideology, people say, what's the ideology? Well, there is no coherent ideology. Instead, there are coherent practices that occupy occupations that, all, that are occurring all over the world that are, they are doing that, right? And so rather than talking about the, the ideas, look up what people are doing. I, I mean, I just, if I could put a, a little bit of a gloss on this. Uh, what a part of what I hear you saying, Jason, is on the one, you know, there's, a participatory form of democracy that Occupy is using, and I think people find that very appealing. Uh, the idea that they can actually exercise control over the facts of their everyday lives uh, is what people want, and what people are getting um, out of being Occupy, rather than feeling two or three steps removed from the <coughs> power, uh, and rather than feeling like economic power is being exercised without their consent or, or their, you know, their, their consideration. So, you know, does the world post-Occupy look like everyone living in tents outside and, you know, having a giant meeting of seven billion people every night when we're doing this? I mean, <laughs> probably not, right? But this is, you know, again, common in social movements. The, the student movements in the 1960s were formed up based on, uh, on, on uh, uh, participatory or direct democracy decisions are made collectively. And the idea was, we want a different way of living. And one of the ways we're going to start to put that into practice is by living it right now. Um, I think kind of along the lines of your question, uh, if our system right now, you said, was privileges uh, profits over people, and the goal is to get the exact opposite, how is the state supposed to implement that? How is the state supposed to get to that goal? Well, I mean, there are 
really pretty good responses to that, right? I mean, if you're asking me, okay, okay, the, the most basic level, I personally at the most basic level, there should be more regulation over corporations, right? Over the last 20 to 30, even maybe 40 years, you've seen an increase in the deregulation of the corporate world. Right? Now, what does that mean? It means corporations, they can just run them up and do whatever they want. Right? That is not a way to a better world. It's a way to better profit, but not a way to a better world. But the most basic level, I would say, right, have more regulations of corporations. Right? So if you're talking about working within the state, which is fine, it's a series of policies and regulations that constrain the one human impulse for greed and try to promote and encourage another human impulse, which is to take care of them. I don't mean a nanny state or anything like that in kind of the words might hear in the media. But just basic human sentiment of we are human beings. We live together, we die together. Why can't we take care of each other? Yeah, uh, my question is to the gentleman on the left. Uh, you mentioned uh, the decline of Keynesianism. And while uh, personally, I, I might uh, be happy with such a situation, how could you make that claim when there's been such a rise of deficit spending, bad allowance stimulus programs, the Recovery and Reinvestment Act, quantitative easing? Emergency loans to the government process. It seems like there's been a dramatic rise. Well, it's Keynesianism of a particular kind. It's sort of closeted to Keynesianism in that it's an effort to boost aggregate demand, to maintain aggregate demand. Uh, but it's done uh, not by putting money into the pockets of working people, uh, but rather by uh, limiting, uh, limiting public spending for the most part uh, and even tax cuts. Right. So these are the forms of Keynesianism that are, it's, it's, uh, there's a good piece I read just the other day about this, I don't remember where exactly it was. Um, many on the right would actually it, you know, call what has been done a form of basically right-wing Keynesianism, insofar as it's trying to be precisely that. But it's not built on a, uh, a foundation of the law. Right, but that premise of Keynes, like increased government spending during deficit periods, or during depressions, and that would include spending both on like stimulus programs as well and bailouts, corporate welfare, et cetera, and there's been a dramatic rise in that comparison to previous decades. So uh, it, it would depend on how we measure it, right? right. I mean, I guess I've made two points. One is the Keynesian critique of the deficit spending that has gone on is that it's far too little that the government has to, the federal government should have had a much, much larger stimulus package. All of the stimulus package we had did was stop us from just slipping into a very severe depression. Uh, but we've essentially lost the moment at this point because we, you know, it should have been five or six times the size of the size of it actually was. Um, but my broader <coughs> argument about the decline of Keynesianism was not what's happened since 2008, but what happened between 1970 and 2008. Uh, in the time during which you know the rise of Reagan and Thatcher uh, and the tremendous growth of the financial sector effectively says the state shouldn't be boosting aggregate demand by keeping wages high. In fact, it should be keeping wages low, uh, and it, it should you know uh, maintain aggregate demand to the extent that it does uh, through monetary policy and apparently through a succession of asset bubbles that allow people to continue spending money they effectively didn't have. Right? And isn't that quantitative easing a form of stimulus? Well, so, yeah, it's a form of stimulus. It's, it's Keynesian in the sense that it boosts aggregate demand. It's not Keynesian in the sense that it's not based upon actually putting real resources into people's pockets, right? It's not artificially boosts GDP. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. I'm just wondering, I think about your consumerism. You brought that up. And I'm, I'm sort of seeing, I'm thinking of like Gandhi and sort of the idea that the quick way to get the attention of corporations is not by their products, right? So Gandhi's like, hey, we're not going to use British cloth catches their attention, but that also entails, okay, now we got to spin our own, right, because we need cloth. So how much is that being discussed, this idea of maybe, you know, not putting money into the corporations, but going and buying a Starbucks cup of coffee on my break while I'm in Occupy Philly, right, that kind of thing, as a way of catching their attention, and then if you do do that, if you are not using these new products, it, it seems to entail the need for some self-sufficiency and you need to start, you know, going through your own kind of things. I don't know, how much is that kind of dynamic I heard you talking about food and for, about providing, providing for our homes. Is that what I heard? And did I hear you talk about how that's being done? Sure. Be I mean, I, I guess my quick response, I mean, I, just, I think I understand the basis of the question. Um, right now, at least within Occupy Philly, a lot of what we, a lot of the material, or lack of better words, the material goods that we have are being donated by other people, right? So for instance, I may go to Occupy and bring extra sleeping bags if I have them at home. 
and get donations from, I don't know who, but they come in. I mean, every day stuff comes in. Now, if you're talking about a long term, like a real long term, right? Well, then the question comes, well, then how do we produce our own goods without relying upon the wider social structure that we're fighting against? If I had an answer, I would be on CNN every day, probably. I mean, I, I don't know the answer, but I mean, it's the issue that I think we take baby steps for now. And if we get to that point, then we will figure out a way to do that. In other words, I mean, basic Marxian analysis, we are laborers, we are workers, right? We will produce, and it depends on under what conditions will we will produce. Will we produce for ourselves and for our needs and wants, or will we produce and rely upon, say, for instance, corporations? Uh, but that's a, that's a tough question. That's a, that's a tough question. I think in a very practical human way, what I would say is what someone in Denver reminded me. It's both and, not either or. So I don't have to choose to give up Kathleen and Starbucks today. I can have Starbucks and have the occupation until we get there. We're trying to get something that's really different. And, and just quickly to jump in there, I'm sorry. Um, some people would say, well, that's a contradiction. Right? But that's only a contradiction if you believe in ideological purity. I mean, I don't think any of us are going to say, oh, it's all about pure ideology. It's not. Uh, how do you guys say because you can incorporate or help to grow this movement through people who are not passionate activists like you are. Because the majority of people are not going to have this kind of this kind of fire in their in their belly to have this movement as you guys will, that you guys are. Again, some practical things that I can jump in with right away is um, get online and see what the, what they're saying that they need. So these people a lot of the campers do believe that they are visible on everyone's behalf. And so they could use blankets, that's involvement. If you send some food down there, that's involvement. No, no I, 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 I'm not saying that they necessarily want to get involved. I'm talking about how are you going to convince them to be involved. I mean, if you're talking about, you're trying to make this a, you know, a global, you know, the bare minimum, you know, United States of America movement and change the structure that changes our, the way that we conduct government and business. Then you're going to have to incorporate people that do not have the passion in you. It's a necessity to happen. I mean, apathy is, is a very poignant power in this country. And so, you know, to get those people that are between 25 and 50 that have a comfortable life, how are you going to get them involved in care? How are you going to do that? Uh, well, how many of them have a comfortable life anymore? <laughs> I, I would, you know what? Um, um, but the, 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 I would say a, a, a good amount of people have a comfortable life. Sure. Yeah. Social movements have never succeeded by mobilizing 80% of the population. It's always been 5%, 10% at most. Um, and one of the things I said at the very end of, of my talk is that one of the ways social movements build power and build mobilizability is by having continuing events that get a message out that actually taps into what people believe and what people want. Uh, and to see your friends and neighbors participating is what leads you to participate, right? So that's how the, 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 the social movements spread through networks. They actually spread through the social networks that we already have and the ones that are created over the course of them. So, you know, how to bring new people in, I think as long as protests keep getting slightly bigger, I mean, we had marches two weekends ago with millions of people around the world. If that happens again, after that, and the messages are you know, are resonating with the people, more people can come. Um, and they may not be showing up every day and participating in the you know the decision making process such as it is, uh, but they'll be you know tapping in when they can and it's actually Can you explain the interaction between the movement and the homeless population that was already living where the occupation now is? <laughs> positive interaction. There was a lot of outreach done um, before choosing Dover Plaza as a, as the location for the occupation. There was concern that homeless people have been sleeping there for a long time before we came and basically took their home. Um, it was a really, you know, calm, like positive interaction. People, homeless people are, you know, getting fed. They're part of the movement as far as I'm concerned. I think as far as most people down there are concerned, they are part of our movement. They are, there are homeless people involved with safety. There are homeless people involved with food and comfort tents. Um, they're organizing with us. There have been, you know, occasional, like, you know, hostile interactions, but I think it's 
pretty few and far between. It's been a pretty positive interaction. I think there has been a lot of effort and discussion about, you know, sometimes people are, are saying, well, they're not with us. Um, and we've kind of had to deal with that a lot. And I think now the, the way, at least in the letter, is, <laughs> which is kind of the unifying statement as of the moment, is that we are all in this movement together, um, homeless, you know, by choice or circumstance. Thank you. 
see it's like a, a beautiful mess. You know, it's, it's a messy process, but uh, it's a wonderful yeah. one and an inspiring one. And we can change our we can change our minds if it doesn't. Yeah, um, there's been like talk about how Occupy is a global movement. Um, I was wondering how much of it is about protecting the American dream for Americans, um, and how much of it is about reforming the global system as a whole. Because there are workers who are worse off than American workers. I'm sure. Yeah. So, like, I mean, would Occupy? I mean, you'd have to be willing to give up a lot as Americans um, to really help workers of the world. So, I mean, how much of Occupy supporters would want? That? Uh, I, I, it's a, it's a, I, I can, I'll just say a couple things. Um, it's a constant tension in uh, domestic worker rights activism and even global rights activism. Um, I think, and the, 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 there's one question of, I think you have to think about this on two levels, right? There's, what's a, what does a just nation look like and then what does a just world look like? And treat those as, you know, parallel projects. Um, and it's strike, you know, I think it's consistent to say we need better jobs in the U.S. We need a more, you know, just and equitable distribution of wealth in the United States. Um, recognizing that that may have costs in other places, but the imperative is to build a movement that actually tries to address those costs as well. Um, but it's a real challenge. Uh, but I think it's important not to lose sight of one of the reasons why it's a real challenge, which is that uh, global finance is global. And uh, workers uh, are actually not globalized. Workers are confined within nations for the most part. Um, they can move between nations sometimes, but they can lose rights after they move, move across borders. Money doesn't lose rights when it moves across borders. It just becomes money, right? It's a different kind of currency. Um, and so that's the question that it ultimately needs to be taken up. Now, the extent to which people in Occupy are having a discussion or not, I'm not sure. I mean, all of the, um, the the, the uh, younger leftists, uh, lawyers, and other organizers I know are acutely aware of it and are constantly thinking about it. Um, we're actually uh, going to take one more question back right here. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, what the world's going to look like post Occupy. Um, my question is how sustainable is this Occupy movement? Um, that is, what's What's to prevent the one percent from doing what they did in the past thirty years again? Uh, it seems to me the fire sector uh, not only did they create a disconnect between the cash flow and the American worker, but there was also a disconnect between knowledge. And my example is when all this was when everything was breaking down in two thousand eight. I was a college student in economics classes, and I had no idea what the hell a collateralized debt application was. Um, if we don't change the social and financial structures, but there is a connect again, I don't see the movement mm -hmm. making much of a difference in the future. There was a protest yesterday where uh, a number of congressional candidates um, sort of saying they were inspired by Occupy and dropped off petitions at John Maynard Um I think that you know we're coming into an election cycle. Uh, Occupy, I, I think one thing that's going to really limit Occupy's you know, staying power in the U.S. is winter and snow, especially with the exception we're in the Northeast. Um, and, you know, we'll see what happens once the first snowflakes start to fall. Uh, it might not be a confrontation with Bear and that gets people out of the closet. It might just be that it gets too cold. So, but I think that, you know, the, the, the idea behind the movement isn't going to go away. Uh, people will continue organizing like that. but. You know, you may see it become more formalized and you know become a vehicle for political participation, or you may see it. Uh, you know, the Tea Party. It wasn't clear exactly what direction it was going to go in, and it's a very different thing. Um, it has a lot of corporate money for one thing. You know, people sort of centralized trying to direct it. But there was a moment when it wasn't clear. You know, are they going to run candidates, or are they just going to you know sort of be this outside group? And they ended up running candidates. Not like Occupy is necessarily going to run candidates, but maybe I don't know. Um, but Many candidates will probably try to carry the flag because a majority of Americans actually agree with what Occupy is doing. Um, so I think that's you know that's one concrete thing that may come out of it. Other than that, I really think it's anyone's guess, right? I think the important takeaway is that it's really tapped into this anger uh, and frustration that people feel. And 
has done that in a progressive rather than a conservative direction. And just quickly to, to comment on that, I mean, one of the things that movement has done, realize movement was only six weeks in existence here. It's, it's an infant still, right? The um, question though, is it stable? I'm not sure. Hopefully it is. We'll see about the snow, the weather. But the movement has created a national conversation about these very issues that you are addressing, right? So hopefully that can be part of the educational process to help people understand what's going on in our own country. So I will do that. Um, I just wanted to say one thing before we go. There's, there's a couple of questions here that sort of imply things like how many people at the movement would be able to give you that answer, or I don't feel like anybody there really understands the reconstruction or the construction at Dilworth Plaza, and I think that that's the kind of stuff that you can only get answered by actually going down to Occupy. Um, I think if you spent, at, you can't go to just one general assembly, you have to go to a few general assemblies, because from what I've seen, people really understand the construction at Dilworth Plaza. They maybe have a hard time talking about it at a general assembly using the people's mic because they can only say three words at a time, but we have breakout groups and people really understand what's going on. And you don't know that unless you've been there. And you have to go a few times and you have to stop people and talk to them. There are a lot of really intelligent people there who know what's going on. And I'd say that's the majority of people who are involved. I've had some of the most interesting conversations of my life at Occupy Philly and they sound just like this panel. So that's what I would say. Go to a general assembly, go to two, go to three, go for an entire week so you can watch the process of something like the letter being written. It took a week and a half for, there's probably about 200 people that are always at the general assemblies and then a moving group of another 200 people. And in a week and a half, that group of people through a process of direct democracy talked about and wrote a letter with demands and concerns that is being released <coughs> to the city. That's amazing, and I think that's faster than our own government looks. So it's worth going in there. And thanks for coming.